All right. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for um, this uh, session of, for the Clinician Engineer Hub. Um, today we have uh, Prof. Ray Yao from the National University of Singapore, and uh, he'll share with us a little bit about his work um, uh, with soft and uh, hybrid robotics. So uh, I'll keep the introduction short and I'll let uh, Prof. Ray take it away. Prof. Ray, over to you. All right. Uh, thanks, Darren. Uh, happy to be invited here to, to be part of the webinar series okay, for the uh, Clinical Engineer Hub. All right. A very good day to everyone. Uh, here in Singapore, um, so I suppose uh, it's a different time zone for most of the uh, attendees. Right. Okay. So today I'll be sharing. Um, okay. Let me just admit another guy. Okay. I'll be sharing about soft robotics and how soft robotics has been uh, you know, applied in healthcare. So we have been uh, doing a lot of, uh, at least my lab, we have been working a lot on soft robotics, okay, at least for the past uh, 10 plus years. Okay. And a lot of our innovations has been applied to uh, you know, real healthcare use. Okay, so to introduce myself, I'm Ray. I'm a professor with the uh, Department of Biomedical Engineering. At NUS, I'm also the deputy head, so uh, I do a lot of outreach to uh, prospective students, uh, also getting uh, industry partners to work with us, okay, to better uh, engage our students. Okay, I'm also a researcher with the Advanced Robotics Center. Okay, on the national level, I'm the program lead for soft and hybrid robotics. Okay, I'm also a co-founder for a couple of companies. Okay, that we commercialize some of the technology that we developed in the lab. Okay, so if you want to contact me, you can feel free to contact me at the uh, email. Okay, so uh, I'm sure everyone uh, knows about hard robots. Hard robots are you know, the very traditional um, large size robots that we see in factories that are used to uh, automate assembly of, um, okay, assembly of, uh, for instance, automobiles. Okay, so in, the, in this case, uh, they are really high precision, able to deliver uh, high force. Right. But if we were to use this kind of hard robots to interact with patients, we will you know, tend to be a bit more cautious, right? Because we do not actually want that large amount of force to be delivered to you know, our patients. Okay, so this is where we start to look at soft robots. Okay, soft robots are okay, already seen in the uh in the uh nature. Okay, you have uh, this sort of coral tentacles. Okay, that are extremely uh, made of uh, soft materials or so soft structures. Okay, in this case, they can bend uh, with less precision, but good enough to you know, uh, achieve their uh, survival needs. Okay, so this is where we start to branch into uh, soft robotics. Okay, basically, a new kind of uh, new class of robots that are made of uh, soft compliant components. Right? Mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, it, is able to achieve a unique range of capabilities. Okay, for instance, you have uh, a varying degrees of uh, freedom. They can achieve complex movement that we do not see with uh, the traditional robotics uh, counterparts. Okay, and because of that, uh, there is a growing application or use cases in terms of being used as uh, assistive devices, used as a locomotion robot, okay, or be used for grasping and manipulation of delicate items. Okay, so the pictures below you see uh, are some of the soft uh, grippers or soft exosuits, okay, or you know soft locomotion robots that is uh, you know very much different from what we have been looking at in terms of uh, uh, those wheel or track traditional robots. Okay, so these are some of the capabilities that uh, soft robots are capable of. Of course, these are only uh, a few of the uh, many possibilities. Okay, so here we have the extensible robots. Okay, I hope you all can see the video clearly. If you have any uh, issues with the videos, then you can you know, sound off to me okay, or you can indicate the chat box. Okay, those are extensible contract, uh, contracting robots. Okay, bending robots, in this case, is, uh, you know, as you can see, the very tentacle-like uh, structures okay, that we see in the earlier coral tentacles videos. Okay. Can also create a uh, twisting actuators, right? Okay, so by combining the soft material with uh, um, certain layers of fabric, we can actually achieve uh, you know interesting twisting uh, profiles. Okay, in terms of 
jamming okay, actuators or soft actuators in this case has been used for jamming as well. So we can achieve, uh, I'm not sure whether you can see the video. Okay, using a tubular jamming beam, you can actually you know, transit from a soft actuator to a almost a rigid uh, beam. Right. So this kind of transition is what we call variable stiffness. So in this case, we can have a robot that has a hybrid capabilities. Okay, not just being soft, it can also be a hard robot that uh, can be used to stabilize certain structures. All right. Okay, so this is essentially a spectrum of um, robotics. Okay, what you see on the top left uh, are the high hard robots. Okay, they have uh, actually high precisions can be used to repeatedly you know do assembly tasks. Okay, for instance, in this case, the cars. Okay. If we move down the spectrum, we start to see uh, robots that are more compliant. Now we do see a lot of this, uh, such as the, the big dog, okay, that can you know, patrol the, the uh, parts. Okay. So they have a slightly more compliant nature, but they're still made of uh, hard materials. Okay. What is compliant is their algorithm okay, that allows, us, allows it to move in a, uh, a more compliant state. Okay. But of course, the gap is actually, you know, uh, is super compliant uh, area okay, where robots can play in. Okay, so in this case, we have uh, on the extreme end, the highly compliant robots would be the fully soft robots. Okay? Uh, robots made entirely of soft material, okay, in this case, entirely made of fabric, okay, can be used for irregular or delicate object interactions. Okay? So for instance, a glove entirely made of fabric and you wear it on the patient, it can help the patient with uh, very delicate uh, movement. Okay, so in between, there's another gap which we call the uh, uh, where we want a bit more precision okay, and less compliance. Okay, this is especially important when we want to do a very uh, high speed task. Okay, because if it's entirely soft, you imagine uh, you know, if I were to have a gripper grip on something and then we ask it to move at a fast speed, okay, the, the item is likely to slip off because of the compliant nature of the actuators. So in this case, having a hybrid uh, robots will have uh, rigid structures okay, that will give it additional uh, precision over soft robots. Right, so today I'll be really looking at this, this two portion, the soft and the hybrid robots. Okay, if you were to look at uh, soft robots where Singapore stands, okay, despite us being uh, in a very small country, okay, uh, we are actually among the top 10 in uh, soft robotics research. Okay, and you can see, uh, you know, um, this is almost uh, the, the rest of the G8 here that is you know highly um, investing okay, uh, a lot of resources into soft robots because we, we do see soft robots being a, a key player okay, in um, automating okay, a new sector that uh, hard robots cannot uh, uh, do well in. Okay, I'll basically start with uh, my first so of first chapter on the software robots, okay, and then the second chapter um, will be on soft robotic manipulators, right? So these will be the two areas that we're looking at, okay? These are essentially the two areas that uh, I would say our lab is uh, focusing quite a bit on, okay, in terms of uh, healthcare innovations. Okay, so one of it was uh, looking at uh, motor, hand motor impairment, okay, we know stroke patients, on, Patients with stroke, with spinal cord injury, with bracket plexus injury, they have, all have some form of hand motor impairment. Okay, and that impairment can exist in the inability to flex or inability to extend or both. Okay, as you can see over here in all these videos, okay, the hand disability can actually affect okay, how the um, individual okay, can you know, uh, perform their daily tasks okay, uh, effectively. Okay, so if you were to look at this, we will also want to know what is the uh, traditional wearable robots okay, that we used to see in the past you know, uh, 10 years. Okay, these are robots that are made of uh, rigid linkages okay, driven by electromechanical linear or rotary motors. Okay, so as you can see, these are highly uh, intimidating to the patients. Okay, so the recept uh, receptiveness to use this uh, devices can be quite uh, limited, okay? And of course, one thing is that using rigid components, it can actually interfere with joint movement, right? Because we know our joints, or at least the finger joints do not move in a single plane of uh, uh, 
uh, motion, right? So if we were to use a a single plane motors to to drive movement, okay, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to limit uh compatibility. Okay, so that, so that is why we, we actually came up with uh you know during the mid 2014, 2015, okay, we developed the soft robotic glove, okay, with the aim to um, support the full hand range of motion. And also looking at it being lightweight, then we can you know, use the device at home. Okay, especially for stroke patients, they can you know, do the rehab at home without having to you know, uh, you know, spend time and uh, money okay, to, to go to the rehab clinic to do their uh, therapy. Okay, so how do we go about to do this soft robotic glove? Okay, we actually um, use one of the capabilities that I've shown earlier, the bending tentacle light uh, actuators. Okay, this is actually what we see as a bio-inspired bending actuation mechanism. Okay, we know the, the tentacles uh, that corals have, or even that of the octopus, they are dri basically driven by muscular hydrostat, right? That means uh, using a, uh, by varying the internal pressure, can actually create certain kind of movement. Okay, so, so here is how we adopt that kind of concept, okay, having an elastomeric layer at the top and a restraining layer at the bottom. And then the elastomeric layer will have its features, which we call the pneumatic network. And then by introducing the uh, input pressure, okay, we can actually drive bending of that actuator. Okay, so, and that allows us to you know, achieve this kind of uh, curvature kind of bending. Okay, and of course we do some simulation to, to prove that. Okay, so how does this uh, essentially you know, evolve? Okay. okay, because over here, what we are using is a silicon elastomeric uh, material. Okay, silicon elastomeric material is almost like, behaves almost like balloon, right? So we introduce air, it's going to you know, balloon all around. Okay, there will be a you know, reduction in the energy efficiency. So what we do is to add corrugated fabric, okay? And that will help to uh, minimize uh, radio expansion, okay, and help to drive uh, the bending motion, right? So this is our very early days kind of um, uh, actuator design, okay, which subsequently led to the first version of the robotic glove, okay. So with the bending actuators embedded within each of these finger pockets, okay, of the gloves, and then we have our own fluidity control system. We can actually drive an uh, individual isolated movement of the fingers. Okay, and then this is done using a PID controller, okay, where we can then control the pressure input okay, via the palm, the valves, and the sensors. Okay, so subsequently, we, we attempted uh, a range of our uh, user control strategies. Okay, okay, I think the simplest one would be using a button. Okay, various button controls for different kind of uh, grasping posture, like pinching. Okay, in this case, it's a tripod pinch, right? Or if you put... Uh, Press on this button, you will get a, a full uh, power grass. Okay. Or you can also use a myoelectric control. So imagine these stroke patients have uh, uh, some weak muscle signals coming up from the forearm. Okay, we can actually uh, tap on this weak signals, amplify it, and then use it to control the uh, the glove. Okay, so in this case, it's sort of an intent driven uh, therapy. Okay, what the, the stroke patient has to do is to you know focus on using the particular muscle. Okay, and then we can help the hand you know, to do grasping. Okay, the other way is a mirror therapy that uh, is also one of the approaches that um, we have clin clinician uses. Okay, so stroke patients, uh, some of them are hemiplegic. Okay, hemiplegic means on one side uh, be paratic, the other side is still healthy. So you can use the healthy hand to drive the movement of the unhealthy hand, right, using the mirror therapy. Okay, so these are just some slides on uh, the technical characterization that we do just to make sure that we achieve the specification that we want. Okay, so in this case, we are able to you know, achieve an application of force at the tip of up to nine newtons. Okay, the grip force okay, can uh, read, this is around 12 to 18 newtons, right? So that's about 1.2 to 1.8 kg in terms of the uh, possible uh, weight that it can handle. The, when the glove is uh, actuating. Okay, we also study some range of motion tests just to make sure that uh, you know, between uh, active 
which is uh, not assisted by the glove. Okay, versus assisted by the glove. This is done on the healthy subjects. Okay, the range of motion do not differ much, right, between the different uh, finger joints. Okay, of course, we also track that the uh, when the glove is active, okay, the uh, the subject is not actually using their own muscles to provide that range of motion. Okay, so with this glove, we can actually achieve a variety of grasping posture. Okay, and then of course, uh, there's some publication here. Essentially, here is to show that the uh, we are using the glove, we are able to assist in the movement okay, with sufficient range of motion. Okay, we did some feasibility tests with the patients. Okay, okay, without a glove, uh, the patient has uh, you know, no way of uh, grasping the uh, item, right? So with the glove in place, you can actually provide that grasping uh, capability. In this case, uh, a box and block test. Okay, okay without a glove, you can pick up a, a, uh, the blocks. Okay, but with the glove, you can actually use the pinch mode to grip on the, the blocks. Okay, the rest is uh, similar, you know, basically with the glove, you can assist with uh, grasping, um, even hand opening as well, right? So we know some stroke patients, uh, if they do not receive uh, sufficient uh, exercises or therapy exercises, they can actually suffer from contracture. Okay, so using our glove, we can actually help to uh, manage contractures okay, in the hand. Okay, this is another stroke patients using the mirror glove uh, therapy. This is the paratic side. This is the healthy side. So using the healthy side can actually help. Uh, basically have uh, some ownership of their own uh, rehab, rehabilitation uh, process okay, so that they can you know, uh, you know, hopefully regain some form of uh, range of motion. Okay, this is uh, using it as a CPM device. Okay, continuously uh, achieve flexion extension of the hand. It okay, can actually improve or uh, uh, prevent but spasticity and uh, contractures. Okay, so a bit more videos over here, um, basically showing, uh, okay, without the glove, okay, the, the patient has uh, you know, really difficulty on manipulating the object. Okay, but once the glove is in place, you can actually see uh, a substantial improvement in, the, uh, in terms of motor assistance. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah. So with the glove in place, you have a higher precision in terms of uh, grasping the object. Okay. <clears throat> so this actually, you know, we also get a quite good amount of feedback from the patient okay, because they, they know that they are, you know, uh, they have lost a good <clears throat> level of motor ability, hand motor ability, you know, since their stroke. Okay, so the, in fact, they do not expect that they will be able to, you know, have some form of movement until they see the glove and able to use the glove. They were actually quite pleased with the, uh, you know, improvement in their um, activities of daily living okay, through the use of the glove. Right. And then the other thing is the glove is, as I say, is a soft robotic glove. It's made entirely of a silicon material driven by air. There's no ferromagnetic uh, uh, parts in it as compared to traditional hand uh, rehabilitation devices. Okay, so therefore this allows us to actually do a study of combining fMRI with uh, hand rehabilitation. So we had the patient, you know, uh, undergo fMRI and then wear the, the robotic glove. Okay, so at the same time, once the therapy is uh, happening, okay, we do see some, you know, interesting uh, activations of the uh, uh, motor cortex, okay. And yeah, so this basically helped to substantiate okay, the effectiveness of using a soft robotic glove. Okay, so these are some of the feedback that we have achieved. You know, generally quite satisfied with the Exo glove. That was, that's the commercial name of the uh, glove. And good thing is MR compatible. Okay, uh, that's basically our, our very first design okay, using a silicon method. But of course, silicon, as we know, is not very durable. And it's slightly still, while well, it's much lighter than the traditional hand rehabilitation device, uh, it still feels a bit of weight on the hand. Okay, so this is where we start to transit into fabric. Okay, advantage of fabric, of course, is uh, uh, you can easily wash it. You can just uh, throw the glove in the washing machine, wash it. Okay, and then after that, you can just wear it again, right? And then, of course, it's even more durable okay, because fabric itself has, you know, uh, very compliant um, material properties. 
Okay, so the technique that we use is to have a fabric-based uh, approach. Okay, we, we design two folds. Uh, I mean, one set of folds okay, over a layer where it's uh, a straining, restraining layer. Okay, so in this case, once we um, insert the, inject the air, okay, we actually create a bending curvature here. Okay, and a good thing is we can achieve bidirectionality. Okay, not just flexion, okay, we can have an extension actuator to provide hand extension. Okay, so this is the some of the tests that we do. Okay, using fabric actually, we can actually achieve um, up to 1.4 kg of tip force and 8.8 .8 newtons of grip force. Okay, so that's pretty sufficient, at least for uh, stroke patients. This okay, just to share with you this video okay, of the fabric actuator, bi-direction actuator, made entirely of fabric, okay, driven by pneumatics. Okay, this is activation of deflection actuator. Okay. Flexion, then followed by extension. Okay, extremely lightweight. Okay, because we do not expect because these are actually fabric that we wear on a very daily basis. Okay, that do not really cause you know uh you know significant effect on our you know, daily lives. Okay, this is where is uh as introduced. Yeah, as I mentioned, using soft material is uh, provides some form of uh, material resilience to the system. Okay, if we were to hammer a traditional hand rehab device, it's not going to be you know operational after all the hammering. Okay, so this is the assistant with flexion, extension, <clears throat> highly compact. Imagine you just have to fold the, the fabric base curve. Okay, this is the app that the my PhD student uh, developed. Okay, you can then basically use it to comp compute or achieve different kinds of uh, grasping postures. Okay, so it can be pinching, tripod pinch, or power grass. Okay, this is how it can be used to grasp a uh, an empty can, a water bottle, okay, a few water bottle up to 500 grams or 500 milliliters is possible as well. Okay, so with this fabric base at Exoglove, actually it, it creates a, a you know a very lightweight option okay, that patients can actually bring home to do their rehab processes. Okay. And of course, we the next thing that we did was to uh, pair it up with a brain computer interface. Okay, we put it on the EEG system on the stroke patient's um, head, and then we collect the signals, and then we use that signals to to convert it to command the glove to achieve the desired uh, movement. Right. So this is uh, in fact, a very interesting study that the patients uh, felt was very useful. Okay, because it's uh, very much intent driven okay so you have to do some uh motor imagery you know upon the cue from the uh the screen okay think about closing the hand then it's, then that signal is, is collected or captured by the eeg system we you use that to um activate the glove to go into grasping okay so once it goes into grasping okay you can easily move it around Right, so we we also look at a, a range of um sort of uh, immersive tasks, okay, like you know arranging um items, sources, okay, lifting it up onto the shelf, okay, or two handed lifting. Okay, these are all very um common tasks that we do on a very daily basis. Okay, pouring of uh, beverages. Feeding. Okay, as well as the box and block test. Okay, that um, perhaps you all are be familiar with. All right, so that was our BCI um test. Okay, so subscreen this entire devices or prototype as transit into a commercial device called the Exoglove Pro. Okay, uh, that is launched by the uh, startup. Okay, let me just disable the music here. Okay, this is just to show 
how the device works. Okay, so this is the commercial device okay, that we have uh, streamlined already. Okay, and then we have a very lightweight hand carried uh, control box. Okay, we can also have a software okay, that helps to provide that motor imagery okay, and visual feedback. Okay, so the patient just has to follow what is shown on the video okay, and then do the pick and place accordingly. Okay, this is transferring of the uh, ice cubes. Right, so this is, um, I would say, a complete system okay, that has been uh, you know, approved by FDA, uh, C, okay, as well as our local HSA authority okay, for <coughs> use in stroke patients. Okay, so these are you know, some of the uh, customers or clients okay, that have used the glove to trans you know, transfer things over to their family members. Okay, to be able to grip a, um, a spoon okay, to do self-fitting. Okay, so now th this device is uh, available in over 15 countries and uh, over 50 hospitals worldwide. Okay, locally, we also do it as a home rental service okay, because we do not see the glove uh, being used uh, by the stroke survivor for the rest of their life. Okay, it could be a three to six months uh, kind of uh, use Right, so we actually use do a rental service, so it becomes a, uh, affordable for the patients as well. Right, so here we see you know initial for one example of a patient. Okay, initially they will have a severe hand contracture. Okay, but over the many months of uh, rehab, okay, using the glove at home without having to make trips down to the rehab gym or the clinic, you can see the contractures actually improve. Okay, over the months. In fact, now we are seeing about uh, over 15 stroke residents okay, uh, benefiting from the rental service. Okay, these are really residents who uh, do not want to own a system, a full system, okay, and hopefully have a you know, more affordable kind of care for them to do it at home. Right, so this is how the Exoglove has evolved from first generation, which is a proof of concept. We did some pilot testing. The second generation, we start to add in uh, new materials, new fabric materials, new control system. We did a clinical testing with our university hospitals. Okay, and then in the third generation, we did a proof of value. Okay, we did a design for our manufacturing, regulatory affairs, etc. Okay, to finally get it to the market. So I would say generally, it's very much important to know what exactly is the clinical need. Okay, we actually had a, a rehab clinicians um, providing all the feedback to us okay, right from the start. Okay, and then we also have the physiotherapies that came along during the development process. So there was a lot of prototyping uh, in, in the entire journey. Okay, and then uh, we also developed a variety of user control strategies. So as you can see, there are button, neuro, EMG, BCI, pressure sensing. Okay, but actually, in fact, um, the, the patients were just fine with buttons. Okay, that's actually the most basic um, a form of uh, robotic we have, okay, they are very comfortable with, okay, and it's more affordable as well, right? So of course, there are many considerations that lead from all this okay, uh, prototyping up to the product stage. Okay, so this is actually one of the um, the flagship product that the startup is uh, working on. It um. So for the soft robotic glove, I've actually put a quite a bit of material or in details into it, uh, into the presentation. And subsequently, I'll just share some of the uh, other devices that we are developing. Okay, that is also going to the startups. Okay, to, to be further uh, tested on patients and then subsequently you know, moved into the product stage. Okay, the other thing that we are looking at is the soft robotic sock. It's basically a device that can help with the ankle exercises, uh, in the automated fashion. Okay, first thing is uh, uh, by moving the ankle of uh, chronic bedridden patients, we can actually prevent uh, contraction and at the same time promote venous blood flow, which in turn prevents uh, deep vein thrombosis. Right, so there's a you know, couple of benefits that we can have by having this kind of assisted ankle exercises. Okay, our very first device having an extension actuator connected between the knee and the dorsal side of the foot. Okay, so if this, if this actuator contracts and extends, you can actually assist with uh, dorsiflexion or plantar flexion uh, respectively. 
Okay, so this is um, very first device or very first prototype. Okay, in the version two, we like we also went to uh, study the uh, possibility of doing inversion, inversion of the ankle. Okay, we also look at um, doing mirror therapy, right? So you have a sensor or a uh, orientation sensor mounted onto the uh, healthy side. Okay, we can use it to control the unhealthy or paratic side. Okay, so this is uh, version two, capable of a more range of motion or the different planes of motion. Okay, with the different buttons in place to facilitate control of the uh, system, right? Okay, so this is one of the, uh, the testing that was done on a stroke patients in the local hospital. Here, I just want to demonstrate how the device can be quickly mounted onto the patients okay, in less than, I think less than two minutes. So the advantage of this sock is uh, over the traditional intermittent pneumatic compression okay, is that the intermittent compression socks that we already see, uh, where, where we already see uh, patients to be using uh, does not help with ankle motion. Right? So in this case, if we were to have the sock in place, it gives two benefits as I mentioned earlier. One is the ankle motion, uh, which leads to prevention of contraction and at the same time promotes uh, venous blood flow and therefore prevents uh, thrombosis. Okay. So these are two key things that we are looking at to prevent these two kinds of uh, complications. Okay, so now we are already in our version three okay? and this is what we call it as the venous and contraction management system or VACOM. Okay, we are planning to, you know, starting next month to commence our longitudinal trials with stroke patients. Okay, so at Alexandro Hospital, okay, I don't have the picture here because of uh, some IP issues. Okay, so, but definitely you will be able to see it um, on our YouTube channel okay, once we are ready to, to uh, uh, release the system. Okay. Okay, this is basically a more clinical grade uh, system that is more robust, that the nurses or the therapists can use okay, on the patients, right? So this is the, I think the, the major trial that we need before we can get it to the product stage. And of course we have other soft wearable robots. Okay, in this case, we have a soft robotic sleeve, okay? uh, still in a very prototyping stage, okay? but we see over here, it can help with uh, elbow flexion extension, a fully 3D printed um, structure. Right. Okay. Elbow rehab or elbow assistance is pretty important, especially uh, you know with um elderly who might not be able to have the necessary range of motion to wipe the table or to get something off the shelf or to you know drink you know consume some beverages. Okay, this can be a concern for you know the elderly with some of these uh, muscle weakness issues. Right. So that's why elbow rehab is also one of the things that we're looking at. Okay, the other thing is more the uh, soft exosuit. Okay, not so much on the patient, but actually more on the nurses, right? We know nurses are involved in very, uh, some heavy lifting kind of, uh, in, they are involved in some heavy lifting kind of scenarios, okay, which can actually uh, hurt their back, right? So because of that, some of the uh, hospital uh, needs was really to, how can we better protect the nurses? So in this case, looking at trunk protection, okay, this is a fully soft exosuit that we are developing. Okay, this is the startup that's going to commercialize that exosuit. Okay, so perhaps you can take a look at the video to, to understand how this works. Okay, a very easy to wear exosuit. You just have to um, buckle it. Yeah, of course, the buckling process can be further streamlined, especially with the use of um, magnetic buckles.
Okay, so the actuators are all at the front of the uh, exosuit, right? So this, when the air is introduced into the system, you can see it being, you know, um, in the actuator state. And that will help to uh, support the um, trunk, okay? So that the back muscles or the, the back muscles uh, do not have to work uh, very hard, okay, to, to maintain the posture. Yeah, of course, if the back muscle forces are reduced, we also expect uh, less compressive forces on the um, spine. Okay, so that is the, the other device that we're looking at. Okay, I'll just spend another maybe 10-15 um, minutes okay, to talk about soft robotic manipulators. Okay, these are systems that we are not that are not worn on the patients, okay, but to be placed you know, near the patients or to near a, a hospital worker to perform uh, assistive tasks. Okay, so one of it is to build a robot therapist that can um, add, act as an adjunct to the human therapist, right? Because we know with a uh, growing amount of uh, with growing amount of um, you know or a growing population, okay, we do see more patients, uh, you know, with uh, some form of motor disability. Okay, and of course, with a uh, manpower constraint, we may not have enough therapists to do all this. Uh, very repetitive tasks. Okay, so here we can actually replace with a therapist robot. Okay, everything here is soft. Okay, of course there's some hard parts which will be covered by a uh, inflatable armor. Okay, but of course the base remains to be um, traditional. Okay, this is how we call it the hybrid. Okay, using the traditional actuators, okay, we can actually have a, a more stable base. Okay, on which the soft arm can be uh, connected to. Okay, so this is a um, button-based control of the arm. All right, then grasping of the items. Okay, so potentially can be used at a cardiac table to you know pick up things for the patients. Okay, if this is using an interface on the laptop. You can actually. Uh, move the system up left and right. <clears throat> yeah, so this is how we can use it to move the arm of the subject, okay. Um, in this case, the shoulder abduction, abduction. Okay, we're also building in the capabilities to be able to make the therapist learn from the human therapist. Right, so we can actually uh, ask the human therapist to move the arm in the desired position that he or she wants. Okay, then the robot will remember the trajectory and then it can play back the entire uh, movement. Okay, it comes with a pair of eyes or cameras that we uh, attach onto the robot. It tracks the, um, it basically tracks the movement of the patient. Okay, with respect to the robot. And this gives us the, you know, the kind of uh, motion analysis that we need. Okay, how much elbow flexion extension is achieved, how much shoulder abduction reduction is achieved. Okay, this can be plotted over time. Then we know what's the number of repetition, how then we can also track what is the improvement in the range of motion as well. Okay, so this is uh, our very first uh, design. Okay, of course, um, we're going to improve it uh, a bit further. Okay, we are actually get quite a bit of um, requirements on new feedback from the therapists okay, in our various pri public and private hospitals. Okay, so looking at improving it with uh, you know, two arms will give even a better you know, control of the uh, rehab process. Right, so also looking at a few more um, improvement okay, to certain components to make it a bit more uh, streamlined and a bit more compact for use in the wards. Okay, the other manipulators that we are looking to build is uh, not so much of um, direct interaction with patients, but more of how can we automate the process of assembling hospital meals. Yeah, because that is also a very uh, highly tedious process and also very manual. 
okay, we have uh, many workers okay, in the central kitchen okay, doing all the scooping and dishing onto the trays. Okay, and then this will be then delivered to the patient. Okay, but of course, this is actually uh, manual, very tedious. Uh, hospitals now is already looking into how automating these kind of processes because looking ahead in five to 10 years time, we are going to see a shortage of uh, manpower who is willing to be in the central kitchen to do all this and repetitive dishing um, um, tasks. Right, so that's why we developed the gourmet grip system. Okay, this gourmet grip basically have three fingers. The three fingers can move around in different posture depending on the, the item that we are looking at. Okay, and it comes with a vision AI that can recognize every of this item. They okay, know what shape it is, okay, what object it is, okay, and then decides on what kind of posture to use. Okay, here we have a 3D printed fingers can last uh, 25,000 cycles. Okay, we've got significant change in the outputs or in the perform performance. Okay, and then uh, it can do very high speed pay and place. Every item, three seconds with uh, object recognition. Okay, with this uh, one single end effector, we can actually pick more than 50 different items. Right, so this is one example of uh, how the item can be transferred from the trays of uh, food items okay, into the casseroles. Okay, so this is one example that we have been working on or use cases for in-flight catering. Right, so you know our in-flight catering meals, okay, they have a variety of food items. Okay, so we're working with our Singapore's um, uh, the, the in-flight catering companies, we can actually assemble all these casseroles okay, uh, without the need for you know, uh, extensive human labor. Okay, so this gourmet grip uh, can grip items uh, that are either raw or can be processed. It, because essentially the sleeve that we use here are food safe sleeves. Okay, can uh, lift up to a kg uh, in terms of the food weight. The grip width is about three to seven cm. So basically it can uh, grip quite a, quite a huge uh, range of uh, food items, common food items. Okay. Because we are using soft actuators, we do not see any uh, food damages. Okay, as compared to traditional, very rigid uh, grippers. Okay to get the grippers to pick a tofu or pick a pudding, right? That tofu or pudding is going to be you know, squash. Okay. And of course we are using vision AI, we do not require any uh, uh, one-time calibration okay? because the AI will recognize uh, right from the start what item it is okay? and then uh, decides on what is the optimal posture to adopt. Okay, so we have a few uh, kind of setups. We have uh, a conveyor setup that you see that we use for the in-flight catering. Okay, we also have a mobile platform that can be pushed to the uh, kitchen station okay, to be something that is very convenient to be deployed into the uh, hospital kitchens. Okay, so some additional videos over here. Okay, this is one example of a food station in our uh, hospital kitchen. Okay, so you can use it to pick up different kinds of uh, food items. Okay, in this case, uh, cabbages. Okay, these are all wet items. Okay, these are noodles, or Asian noodles. All right, so dry and wet items are all possible. It's just that dry items are, you know, we are more confident of uh, rasping that. The wet items, they, because of the gravy issues, uh, um, they can be quite messy, right? But of course, uh, we are also tr trying to resolve that by having um, an additional feature added to the gourmet grip to be able to minimize uh, dripping of the, the gravy, All right? So just also to show if you showed you the capability of the gourmet grip. Okay, to pick up items of uh, varying shape and sizes and stiffnesses. Okay, we'll cake, right? And this is the baby corn. Okay, a bunch of dry noodles. Okay, dumpling. This is the pudding. All right, so uh, gourmet grip is one of it. Uh, the other one is crockery grip. 
Okay, because in some hospitals, their settings are a bit different. They do, they do not, they actually pre-dish everything. And then after that, uh, what they need to do um, is to just assemble the different bowls and plates onto the tray and then send to the patient. So their, their problem statement is more on how, how to automate placement of the crockery. Okay, so we develop a different kind of system okay, called a crockery grid. You can grip uh, over up to three kg okay, with uh, five to 30 cm in terms of grip, grip, grip width. Okay, so this is the example that we have. Um, so we have the vision in place, recognize the different kinds of uh, crockery, whether it's a, a big bowl, small bowl, square bowl, or cut. Okay, you will expand accordingly to do your gripping. These are all soft uh, actuators. So it's very good for interacting with uh, you know, very delicate, materials or materials that can, you know, are pretty fragile. Okay, so in the hospitals, this will already be uh, filled with food items, okay, and then there'll be a, a cling wrap over the uh, items and then will be sent over to the patients mm -hmm. once the, all the property are in place. <clears throat> okay, so that is the First version, <clears throat> now we are looking at expandable ripper, the second version, okay, which actually looks uh, much better in terms of the uh, design. Okay, so this is the startup that is looking at <clears throat> the gripping system. Okay, using a spiral design, we can actually deploy the actuators um, outwards. And then it also comes with a uh, rotatable um, actuators. <clears throat> So this gives a lot of versatility in terms of the uh, manipulation for really a huge range of objects. Okay. <clears throat> Not just crockery, we can actually assemble um, you know, fast moving consumer goods like your cereal or your shampoo. <clears throat> and most of these are not well graphs with uh, suction, right? So suction cannot do, uh, cannot grip, many things in this case. So using a expandable gripper coupled with suction basically covers many grounds, allowing us to, to pick you know, up to 30 different items okay, and that number is still uh, increasing. It's good for picking uh, deformer objects like packet of potato chips or, or refill pack of you know, shampoo or detergent. All right, so what's next is um, really looking at even more intelligent wearable manipulators, okay, manipulators that you can wear on a self, okay, which essentially make, makes it a third or fourth arm, right? It can be even more flexible or even, you know, working with dual manipulators. In the case of a therapy robot, having dual manipulators will make a lot of sense okay, to, to ensure a proper execution of the therapy exercises. The okay, next thing you can be looking at is uh, biohybrid robots. Okay, how can we integrate uh, cells with robots? Okay, this is something that is up and coming okay, where we have uh, cardiac cells you know, <clears throat> combining with uh, some robotic structures can give rise to you know, um, interesting kind of um, actuation. Okay, and of course, uh, what we are seeing here uh, across industries, okay, especially you know, this decade and also the next decade, we are seeing a growing need for Delicate automation. Okay, delicate automation is what we uh, see that the traditional hard robots are not so well, uh, well suited for, right? So this is where soft robotics comes in. Okay, and uh, here we are looking at healthcare. Okay, next we are also looking at uh, F and B, agri tech, logistics. These are places that we are seeing, you know, importance of delicate manipulation. And then of course we are also looking at new projects. The okay, bringing robots down to the uh, underwater space to, to manipulate some uh, delicate structures in the offshore platforms, or can it be used in space to manipulate um, you know, satellites or debris in the uh, space regions? Okay, so these are some of the uh, projects that are going to come in place. Okay, I would say you know, at least within a year, okay, we are starting to see more of these projects happening. Okay, so I just want to end off with uh, a conference that we are organizing in Singapore next year, okay, 3 to 7, uh, 3rd to 7, April 2023. We're going to hold the IEEE International Conference on Soft Robotics, okay, or in short, RoboSoft in Singapore. 
Okay, I'm the uh, conference chair for this uh, conference. Okay, if you're interested, we'll come you to, to be part of this. Okay, you'll get to see uh, amazing range of uh, software bots that has been, you know, achieved uh, worldwide, okay, as well as uh, some of the robots that has been, you know, deployed in the market okay, for a variety of uh, use cases. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, feel free to, you know, uh, provide any questions. Okay, happy to, you know, answer them. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much, Prof. Ray. I think it's like really interesting to see how um just a, a, a field like soft robotics actually is able to uh, transcend uh, so many boundaries. You know, it's not just the, the field of medicine. It goes it goes beyond that actually. Yeah. So um anyone here has uh, any questions that you'd like to ask? Feel free to uh, shout out. It's a nice and cozy um, space. I think just a handful of us here. Otherwise, I, I do have a question. Um, so like with regards to um, the, like earlier you, you mentioned about um, how uh, in general, there is a trade-off between uh, precision, you know, in the hard robots and when you go to the, the, when you start using hybrid or soft robots, you tend to lose precision. Like what, what are some ways that you know you can uh, overcome this loss of precision, so to speak? Yeah, some ways would be um to have some form of rigid endoskeleton. So in this case, having a mixture of a uh, soft and uh, rigid materials okay, will help. <clears throat> Uh, the rigid materials ideally should not be the, the one that is um, outside the, the robot or on the external surface. It should be the one at internal so, so that the soft material continue to be on the external side to provide a kind of uh, um, protective or cushioning effects. Okay, so in this case, um, by having the rigid endoskeleton, as we see, yeah, maybe I didn't mention clearly, okay, in our Gumi grip design it actually has a, uh, I would say, endoskeleton that is not soft. Okay, and that provides the rigidity that is needed for manipulating uh, this kind of fruits, especially at high speed. If you were to use a soft finger and then we just move it at high speed, the soft finger will just you know, fling around okay, because of the nature of this uh, material. Okay, then you will see the eggs uh, flying all over the, uh, the factories. Okay, so to prevent that, we need to have a rigid endoskeleton in place, and that will give us uh, sufficient uh, firmness okay, during the gripping process. And at the same time, a very delicate uh, touch on the, the items. Okay, and with soft robotics, like uh, one of the the things that um is quite essential would be the supply of uh, air, right? So you you need a pump, you need um various uh, actuators to deliver the the pressure required. So uh, when it comes to rehab devices, I think you you mentioned a lot of um recent advances where you know things get smaller and smaller to the point that you know patients can actually bring it home. So like just just for just as an idea, like how big are these um. Uh, is, is the is how big are these palms and actuators that we are not seeing in the videos they have shown us? Yeah, uh, the ones that we have in the lab, okay, we usually test it with a compressor. So the compressor is almost like a a, um, a printer that we, we use like It's pretty huge. Okay, but once we start to transit into um. The clinical testing, we cannot use, we cannot move that printer size uh, compressor into the uh, hospitals. Uh, and it's also extremely noisy. So this is where we start to um, work with vendors who are more familiar with uh, pneumatics. Okay. Um, and then we start to look at, you know, very small form factor, right? So now this is still quite big. Okay, but if we were to look at the, the one um, by the startup, okay, this is extremely compact. Okay. Um, I mean, I would say it's probably a, in the range of very, you know, extremely small, uh, you know, uh, box kind of form factor. Okay, and very lightweight as well. It's less than a kg, or uh, I think even less than a uh, five hundred grams. Okay, 
And then um, that's why it's actually lightweight. And of course, looking forward, we can actually expect uh, even improvement in terms of uh, the size. Okay. Because you know, we are not in the, the uh, motor pump space. Okay. But of course, the motor pump space is always innovating with time. And then we start to see more of this motor pump getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. And of course, we, I mean, looking ahead, we are also looking at uh, devices that are, are not required to be powered by air, right? So we start to see some dielectric materials that we are developing. Okay, without a need of air, we can actually use um, electric currents to drive uh, the movement of the head, uh, the movement of the actuators. Okay, and these are really uh, low voltage, okay, sorry, low current, low uh, amperage current, okay, that is still safe for use with uh, humans. Right. Okay. And I guess um, to end off, like, I, I guess some people might be wondering, like, you know, oh, I'm interested in this space. How can I start, you know, um, whether you're in Singapore or overseas, um, any tips that you want to offer to um, our guests? Uh, yeah, I think if you um, Google soft robotics, okay, there, there are actually a few um, resources. Uh, in Harvard, there's uh, a soft robotics toolkit. Okay, if you <clears throat> have the time and bandwidth, okay, you can spend some time to study it. Okay, uh, I mean, this could be quite technical, right? Okay, but if you are able to study it, then you, know, you can pick it up pretty fast. Okay. Um, the other way is, uh, I mean, there are, I think there are also a different range of uh, top uh, soft robotics materials out there. Okay. Uh, at least on my side, if you were to go to our YouTube channel, okay, uh, Ray Lab, okay, you should be able to see some of the do-it-yourself uh, soft robotics uh, projects uh, that, that you can you know, pick up very simple um, systems or simple concepts on how to build your own actuators using a, a bunch of... Uh, um, sticky tapes, right, and uh, an air pump. You can actually build your own actuators. Okay, so if you want to be a bit more adventurous, then you'll see we also have a fluidity control board that if you're familiar with Arduino, then you can use that to, you know, uh, program the control board to power your actuators. Yeah, so I think growing amount of resources out there, okay, we also have a undergrad course in NUS that teaches us soft robotics. Yeah. So unless you, you are interested to be our student, then that's, the, that's one way you can learn about soft robotics. Thanks. Right, okay. So if there are no further questions, um, thank you so much, Prof Ray. Thank you for uh, being here. And uh, thank you all for uh, coming for this session. Hope to see you guys at uh, future sessions organized by the Clinician Engineer Hub. Okay, see you. Great, thanks, Darren. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Okay.